Hello, I'm Deborah Malone, founder of The Internationalist and host of Internationalist Marketing TV. Today's guest is Alan Adamson, branding expert, author, and co-founder of Consultancy Metaphors. Alan, what a pleasure to see you. I'm really excited to uh, talk about the new book since I'm I'm a fan of some of the old ones, um, which are still quite relevant, but but welcome to the show. Thanks, Deborah, for inviting me. It's uh, fun to be back. Yeah, it's what, what a pleasure. Look, I'm I'm really looking forward to talking not only about the book, but but a lot of things going on in the industry. Maybe we can touch on on those topics that we we never stop hearing about, whether it's growth or or the how the CMO has been overrun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, let's um let's begin with what what at least I perceived as as the premise at the heart of seeing the how. And that is how you discuss how today's most successful businesses are those that have significantly transformed our daily routines, or as you say so eloquently, have made life as we live it better. Why is this so important to shift for brands? Well, to go back to the future a bit, uh, when I, uh, earlier in my career, I was at Unilever for, for many, many years. And marketing at Unilever uh, was about looking at whatever product the development people had created, whatever soap, <laughs> um, finding out something about that soap that would be better, uh, better for your skin, wash one side with dub, the other side without dub, and then communicating that. And that was marketing. Uh, it was not thinking about how to really, I mean, it was solving a problem for a consumer, but it was solving it in a completely product-centric way. And as you know, over the years, the difference between, I shouldn't say this, one soap and another, or one cereal and another, has been shrinking. And a uh, professor at Columbia recently wrote a book called The End of Long-Term Competitive Advantage. And that is, even if you come up with a better mousetrap, <laughs> a better soap, a better toothpaste, the, the number of days you have that advantage on the marketplace is shrinking before there are five other competitors. So marketing needs to shift its focus. Um, and being so product-centric, really limited the power of marketing because great marketers uh, get inside people's heads, understand their lives, and can solve problems. And if the only lens they're looking at is how can I make my product smell better, clean better, fight cavities better, they're fighting that growth battle with one hand behind their, uh, behind their back. The other factor that caused me to do this is that uh, uh, over the years, I've started listening to a podcast, an NPR podcast called How I Built This. And it's with a host named Guy Raz, and he interviews lots of startups, you know, for years. And as I started listening to these new companies, from Bonobos to <laughs> the Airbnb and their founder story, each were interesting. But I realized after listening to 20 of them, because I would listen to them while, you know, actually walking during the pandemic, because um, uh, I had plenty of time to, to do calls from the woods, not from a, a desk in Manhattan. Um, I noticed that most of them were not based on better mousetraps. Even the ones that are they're big now, from Uber to Airbnb, it was not about inventing a new hotel room <laughs> or a, you know, a new type of taxi. <laughs> it was about changing how we do things. And it became clear that lots of these businesses were not being founded on going to the lab and say, can you make this work faster, better, cleaner, better, or stronger. So, uh, I thought it was time for marketers to shift from being so product centric. In fact, when I was in Unilever, my title first was a product manager. <laughs> it was all about the brand. Then they evolved that to brand manager. But now if you talk to consumer goods companies, in fact, when I spoke to General Mills, they have experience managers because they realize that if they only talk about, you know, 22% better than the competition, it's going to be limiting their growth. You've brought up a couple of things, um, and I'm I'm just chomping at the bit to to run through so many of them. But uh, while you mentioned General Mills, you had a wonderful quote in the book um, from um, a person. I think it was uh, Douglas Martin, who was their chief was it chief brand and disruptive growth manager, who yep. who emphasized exactly what you just said about what happened in your experience at Unilever, in that they were always trying to think, how do you make it crunchy or crunchier, or how do you make it low-cal, if that was, the, that was the trend. And one of the things that you talk about 
is consumer or or customer experience and related to what you were just saying about the podcast with Guy Raz and so on. Talk a little bit about customer experience and what that means, because I it's one of those words that that sometimes confounds me because you know it's 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 a marketing buzzword. Yeah, I mean, it started with the, the famous book by Pine and Gilmore, The Experience Economy, but they were talking about making it more fun and, and just, you know, very much uh, a Disney type of experience. Um, you know, what I was looking at when we when I started thinking about this book was was zooming out because even marketers before used to say, all right, my job is once it's really on the shelf, how do I get somebody walking down the aisle to say, that's my brand, pick it up and choose it over another brand. But in reality, that decision doesn't just happen with me saying, buy my brand, it's better. You know, zooming out and understanding that it's everything from the beginning, how you learn about it, how with your first interaction. And more often than not, it's what happens after you buy it, <laughs> especially in many products that all of a sudden it doesn't work. And um, we're not really just keeping the the user being smart about it. So I, I recently did a, a a story related to this, um, and it's it's in the book a, a little bit, which is for years, if you wanted to buy a complicated product in my generation, whether it was comparing two washing machines or two cars, you know, it was really hard to find objective information because you went through the feature list and everything was a sea of sameness. It was, they were all, you know, washing machines were all the ours recently broke. It, they were all exactly the same. And you couldn't figure out why in all the brand names that a general feeling of quality, but no one was better than the other. And you were left going into a, looking online or left in a showroom where somebody's trying to push whatever one was on sale. And the only way you could find out about it, or one way, was to go to an old thing called Consumer Reports, where they would evaluate you know, cars, washing machines, things that are big expenses, where you just couldn't figure out how to tell the difference. And brand, which was supposed to be a shortcut, I want to buy this because it's better, or this because it's easier, didn't help because all the brands just stood for general quality. You know, uh, big brands that uh, from Maytag to Whirlpool, they were all okay, but nothing, you, you wouldn't drop dead to pick a Maytag over a Whirlpool unless you had some, <laughs> some, some help. And for years, that's the way people did it. And then Recently, um, I noticed that the New York Times had acquired Wirecutter, which was an independent service. But when they did evaluations, they just said, here, if you want headphones, <laughs> you know, and you need them for, you know, listening to classical music, these are the best headphones. If you want headphones for Zoom calls, these are the best headphones. And if you want headphones to give your kids because they lose them every five seconds, these are, and they just give you three solutions and a link. Whereas Consumer Reports would evaluate each headphones have 14 little of that, you know, you know, criteria, Harvey balls are called. This one got 62% here, 40, and you had to be an MBA, and it would take four, and even if you read 14 pages of their analysis, you couldn't figure out, all right, this one lasts longer, but maybe doesn't clean as well. This one cleans better, but has leakage from it was impossible to decide. So that's a great example of someone looking at the experience of what it's like to figure out what product to buy or use it. And saying, yeah, the way it's always been done with Harvey Balls and evaluating 15 criteria, this is not the way it fits into people's lives. They don't have time. They just want to answer which one's right for me if I need this, A, B, or C. And they want to double click it. And finally, Wirecutter solved that. And it was smarter than the New York Times to buy it because it gave them the credibility that if they were testing something, you, you tend, if you were a believer in what the New York Times prints, <laughs> uh, which is another conversation, but you, you, you tended to believe that if they said this headphone was best for running, you bought it. No, well, you, 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 you bring that out beautifully in terms of e explaining an experience that certainly makes life easier, better, simpler, less complicated, whatever the case is. You, you also talked about during COVID when you were listening to the Guy Ross podcast and so on, you were you were learning from a lot of new entrepreneurs that had come up with solutions. Now, I've always believed that there's a real connection between the entrepreneurial mindset and marketing innovation. Uh, let's just talk about that for a minute. I, I'm not sure if you agree, but I, I, I do know that that you um, are. Um, you, you do serve one of the schools um, as an entrepreneur or the entrepreneurial education center 
um, as the, the brand person in residence. So I'd be curious as to where you see that connection. Yeah, so in addition to Guy Raz, I'm lucky enough to work at the Berkeley Innovation Center at NYU Stern School, where I meet with, you know, when I went to business school, everyone wanted to, you know, uh, when I went to NYU, you know, get a job at J.P. Morgan. Everyone wanted to work at a big company. Uh, but now when you go to NYU, very few of the students really want to go and sit in a cubicle for 20 years, hoping they get promoted. <laughs> they want to do something entrepreneurial. And when you meet with these teams, uh, they start at the right place, which is they're looking to solve problems because the best brands solve a problem. And if it just makes life a little better or it's not an important problem, they fail. Anyway, so speaking to lots of them uh, mattered and it was interesting. And, you know, part of it is um, marketers had gotten out of the habit of thinking they were in the innovation business. You know, they were in the, I'm going to sell what somebody else innovates. <laughs> and inside a company, uh, marketers are the best people to, uh, in theory, to lead innovation because in theory, they should be closest to the customer, really understand their pain points, really understand what matters to them. And they should bring that perspective inside. But over the years, more and more marketers just got into the habit of saying, uh, here's how I'm going to tell my story, you know, through advertising, through uh, influencers, through digital. And they got so focused on just the communication part. I think they lost the plot and said, you know, a big part of being successful in marketing is, is, is thinking like an innovator. I had a great conversation with an ex-Proctor client of mine from many years ago who's now very, very senior at LVMH. Um, and I talked to him about, you know, how much of his job uh, is innovation and fashion is much more difficult. But he said, look, you know, if you look at what goes on the marketplace, all the players know each other. They all are just looking right at the competition. We're looking at Gucci or, uh, and, you know, Pepsi's looking at Coke. And they're just seeing the world say, well, Coke does this, we should do this. They're, they are totally fixated on what's happening right in front of them. And they're not really even thinking about the game. They have a certain way to play the game, but an entrepreneur comes into the marketplace looking at the at the chessboard, if you would, from a different angle, <laughs> with without the rules that you can't do this. This is not the way it's done. And so much of the category uh, is driven by people who've been in it forever. I saw this when I worked uh, a lot in, at, at Landor. You had people at a beer company who had been in the beer category for 30 years. This is how you market beer. This is what's important. This is the way the you know, this is the way the, the bartender distributes it. And there's such a hardwired look at the world that they don't see anything else. They, they're so knowledgeable about their world that and there's so little diversity. Everyone agrees and learns the the Anheuser-Busch way of or the Miller way of doing that they, they are no longer innovating. And it's like partly. Innovators bring two things to the marketplace, which I think marketers need to get. One is fresh eyes. How to look at what is and saying, yep, a little bit of Jerry Seinfeld. You ever wonder why people do it like that? And the other is the ability to think beyond just, is there a, 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 a clever ad we can create to convince people to, to drink more Pepsi versus Coke? As opposed to saying, what about the Pepsi experience could be different? What about refreshment matters? And how might we solve the refreshment problem for consumers differently than we did last year. In the book, you're also a big advocate for looking beyond your own industry um, to be able to get those fresh ideas. And I think fresh eyes certainly comes across um, tremendously in the book and including in the dedication to your, your own father at, at the beginning. And um, you know, you you also, speaking of eyes, you also use a term in the book called marketing myopia. Um, do you do you want to just elaborate on that a little bit now? I say, you know, it's a very old concept from uh, uh, marketing. It was, I think, it, who knows when it first came up. It was, a, it was a very, it was a book and then it was promoted in a Harvard Business Review article. And you know, the way they explained it back in the day was that the railroad business got disrupted, not because people, they got disrupted because they saw themselves in the railroad business. They didn't see themselves in the transportation business. And so many industries have that myopic look that I'm in the beer business, I'm not in the social drinking business. <laughs> um, and, and so they, they look at the marketplace through um, uh, a, a very Zoom lens, and they lose their peripheral vision. And peripheral vision is key 
for success in marketing. And if you're myopic and think you're in the airline business when you're really in the, you know, experience travel experience business, you you're going to get disrupted. And the 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 the, the longer you stay myopic, and this has been true since uh, that famous uh, construct was was proposed, um, you you need to be successful. You need to uh, zoom out. And back to your initial question, you know, innovation usually doesn't happen right in front of your nose. You know, Gillette did not get disrupted by Schick. <laughs> Finally, you know, coming up and saying we have six blades and Gillette only has five, or we have this coating, and you know, they got disrupted by somebody completely outside their world saying we're going to sell, you know, Dollar Shave Club, <laughs> we're going to sell razors for a dollar fifty when they were selling them for fourteen dollars. You know, and we're going to send them directly to people's home, and they're not going to have to go to Target. And ask somebody to open the little security counter for them and wait 15 minutes for somebody. To... So, you know, all these categories and a lot more have been disrupted, not by players at the chess table playing each other, but by somebody who doesn't know the rules, <laughs> who's looking at it from a different perspective above or below or from the side, not directly in front of them. And um, and that was a big thing I found at, at Unilever way back when, that at lunch at Unilever, you know, the conversation instantly went to, did you see what P&G did? Did you see what Colgate? We got so hung up on Colgate and P&G. You know, that's all we looked at. And that's still true for many, many companies you see today. They are completely driven by just looking directly in front of them and saying, how do we beat them? <laughs> and this is what they did. And how do we react? They're playing, as I often say, a lot of tennis when you're bad at tennis. But if you want to survive, you try to hit the ball to where the person's not. But if they played more golf and cared less about their competition, and you know, you know, looked at the the course and the wind and and, and looked around them, they would be more successful. No, oh, that that's that that's a wonderful analogy. Um, it and and sports always always seem to serve as as great analogies. You 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 bring up you know so much um, in terms of even the role of the marketer. Um, you know. You talk about disruption a lot, and and what does it take now to be a successful marketer? And and does every company allow someone to be a successful marketer? Because I think sometimes companies shortchange the role by, as you say, having them focus largely on communications. What's the next commercial, or who's the next influencer? And it really is it the strat the strategy at the core. Um, as as well as what I often say, you know, the heart and brains of both, you know, the internal and external, right? Yeah. And, you know, you have to also, you know, as marketers, you know, one of the things that challenging is the marketing, marketing's job has expanded in all the wrong ways. <laughs> it's expanded in finding different ways just to talk to consumers. So now you need to not, of course, be just a, a communications expert and a brand strategy expert. You need to be a, a digital expert. You need to, you know, there are so many more touch points that you can spend your entire day just figuring out how to connect with somebody. It used to be relatively easy. You, there were only a couple, quote unquote, vehicles to connect with people. People paid attention when you talked to them. Right. And now you've got people with multi-screens, ADD, you know, you know, if they look at something for more than eight seconds, it's a lot. And and so they've gotten sucked into this world that my job is more and more about how do you manage the data and looking at the data um, and less and less about, you know, what problems do my consumers have? Uh, and they often don't tell you they because they often assume that this is the way life is. Why should I tell people that I don't like wait, you know, waiting in line when the flight gets changed at the counter? You know, that's that's life. You know, most people just, you know accept it and as we saw with the with the pandemic all of a sudden you know there was a total reset and what was once normal even in business i mean as simple as zoom if i would have called a client up before the pandemic and said gee you know i'd like to you know i don't feel like flying down to dallas this week <laughs> it's, it's only an hour you know uh, let's just do you know a, a facetime call you know i would have heard the you know the click on the phone you know it, it, it you know everything was in person and now, of course, it's become socially acceptable to not necessarily fly to Dallas for an hour meeting every time. Sometimes it is. Um, but, you know, you have to get a reset on. And so marketers need to, to do a reset on the job and say, look, all these things I can do, 
you know, what's really going to drive growth? And that's the other big challenge. The more things you have to do, the more things you do averagely. People can't do lots of, and, and focus and execution is what drives one brand and one company ahead of the other. Uh, that that's that's a very interesting point. That's a very interesting point. And and why don't we just turn to growth a little bit? I I have a quote, and maybe the quote is out of context because the book is so rich in in examples and in concept. But you also emphasize that customer experience is driving more growth than product differentiation. And I I, I think that obviously we've started to talk about that, um, but. Tell me more and, and tell me more about growth in the context of how the marketer's role has changed now and how they get their focus back. Well, every company is not great at doing everything. That's the other thing that uh, part of the research shows that if, if your company is not great at customer service saying we're going to be, that's going to be our number, be careful because, you know, no matter what you do, you have to execute it well. And um, part of it is we live in a world where which we don't talk about a lot, which, uh, which is the most important marketing tools, word of mouth. And every client I often talk to is like, Alan, you got to get me work. You know, how do you get me more buzz on social media? How do you get people talking? You know, you know, how do you get this to go viral? And word of mouth matters because in a world where I can't tell the difference in one toothpaste and the other, <laughs> uh, I don't see a lot of ads. I don't have time to, you know, I'll say, you know, Deborah. What, what do you use for whiter teeth, your teeth look and, and, and every category is impacted. And the, the strategy for how you do that is incredibly simple, but incredibly hard to execute. Uh, and it comes from a, a, a conversation uh, and a, a topic that Tom Friedman, the New York Times columnist, always talks about. And he talks about this notion that average is over. And it's tied to because um, everyone can get access to everything globally, instantly, you know, just being average is no longer enough. But I, I flipped that and said, in marketing, average is over. If your product, you know, you brush your teeth a little bit, it does okay, but it's just average, you're never going to recommend that to somebody. You're only going to recommend a product if it's, um, if it surprises you. You know, if I take a flight and it gets me to LA on time, and they don't lose my baggage, I won't be running up and down social media and saying you gotta fly Delta. However, if I take a flight and you know something extraordinarily good happens that you know I get there and they already know that I'm running late to a meeting and they order a car <laughs> at the airport to get me, yeah, you know, I'm oh my God, Delta knew I had a meeting and they got me through, they got me off the plane first. Yeah, you know, then I'll share that thing, you gotta fly Delta. They did something extraordinary. Of course, extraordinarily bad too. So to get influencer marketing, you have to do a few things extraordinary. And that's a good lens for marketers. While you could be average at advertising and average at customer service, and you know, you can check all the boxes. Um ultimately, um people only share extraordinary. Well, that 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 makes their job harder. I mean, it's become a cliche now, you know, to surprise and delight. Um, but at the same time, to do that really means a, a lot of personalization, understanding that individual, um, right. like say with the Delta example of knowing you had a meeting and, and you know, get the car it, ready to go. That's just a made up example. But yeah, no, no. But I'm yeah, just saying right. that's that that may not be a bad service for, you know, whatever, right. whatever the platinum flyer is called on Delta. But at the same time. Um, it goes back to, you know, innovation, disruption, looking beyond your category. I mean, it, it makes it sound like the, the role of marketing now is, is quite daunting. Yeah, it's much harder uh, because a lot of what your levers are are beyond just calling the agency and say, do something for me. You're, you require your, you know, your manufacturing people to do something. You require your customer care people to do something. Uh, you know, I'll give you another example that's going on right now. It's um, and it's a result of the pandemic. I don't know for my job in the pandemic. Um, besides, you know, working from home uh, with uh, with the family, was I was in charge of shipping and receiving, um, meaning that you know I would you know get the boxes in, you know, and break them down, and then more often than not, I found out that 
forty percent, fifty percent were going back. And then it was my job to find the original box. If not, then put in. So that became a you know a growing task as we went to a hundred percent, you know, uh, virtual. But now we've gone back. But um, if you look at every online marketer, they say, oh, returns are easy. Um, and, you know, just print out a label and take it to the post office. So I was out, uh, I did a, uh, a talk at my daughter's university, and I went to her sorority house, and I, I saw the front porch. It looked like a, a comedy. There were, you know, the boxes were piled to the ceiling. Um, you know, you know, every kid had, you know, not only Amazon, Target, you, know, you name it. It was, a, a, and this was every day. And I went to my daughter and said, you know, what, what happens when you get some, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't have a printer. You know, I've never been to the post office. I don't even know what a post office is. I don't have a car, so I'm not going to go to Fed. In other words, it was, they were thinking of you know, returns are easy. Oh, yeah. But easy for who? <laughs> and yeah. easy if you got one box a week, but a nightmare, as I was in the pandemic, <laughs> of a year more. And so innovation happens. There's a new company called Return Queen. Which you know is not it's just starting, but you know they'll take back you, you just scan whatever you take a picture, they will then print the labels, come to the house, pick it up, and then send you an email when the company has refunded the money finally. So all of a sudden, you know they see a problem that if you ask somebody, are you satisfied with the return policy on Amazon where they print a label? Most people are because that's the way it's always been. But sooner or later, someone's going to realize that. You know, the issue is not one package, but five boxes from four different marketers where you're not sure it made it back. You, you, the label fell off and, and start solving problems beyond that. Uh, and that's a marketing challenge <laughs> for each of these companies. But very few marketing people are worried about how easy it is to return. They just assume the average is all I have to do is send a label and give them a refund and I'm done. But maybe that's not the best. No, I, I you know, I, I absolutely see what you mean. Um, so it could, is it possible for every brand um, as mundane as it might be, like toilet paper, for example, to um, actually in, in your language, see the how and be able to think differently enough that they can create preference and growth? Or is, is, it, uh, is it really for the extraordinary? No, I, I think they have to, each brand has to figure out, you know, I can do 50 things. What can I execute really well? And what will matter to the consumer? And you know, let's look at, you know, toilet paper for years. It, it was the, the, the first game I talked about. One brand would say we're soft. Next brand would say we're more soft. One brand would say the last one. Yeah, it was, it's a complete product focused sale where I'm, you know, I'm not working with P&G anymore <laughs> in that category, but you know, but ultimately it's probably going to go the way of Dollar Shave Club, which is who wants to think about it? <laughs> you know, you just want somebody to to ship you the right thing once a month so you never run out and never have to think about it again. So lots of brands that were totally product focused need to realize that maybe they need to win on becoming totally out of mind <laughs> and easy to use or other dimensions. Um, right. so, unless they can detect colon cancer or, you know, whatever, right. whatever. Exactly. You know, yeah. it, it, yeah. So sooner or later, every one of these categories that has been so product centric and myopic needs to realize that, you know, they can't get 10% more softness than before. And the Pampers was constantly driven by better leak protection and then Huggies would match it. It was a cat. But if that, if they continue to play that only game and, and they're not, you know, it's very much into the subscription. You talk to new mothers today. And when I was a parent, you know, it would be the trip to Costco or Target and, you know, big, big things in the car and squeezing it in. Now, new mothers today just subscribe to all this stuff, either through Amazon. And once they, you know, click on everything they need, they're not lining up um, you know, with a screaming kid in a, in a stroller at a retailer anymore. So, you know, part of it is figuring out and, but even just being convenient is no longer enough. How do you be more convenient and surprisingly convenient? Um, and not just saying, are you happy with the toilet paper? Because most people say, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, and, and deliver on your promise. Um, that leads right. me to something else. I so just a comment, um, um, you know, uh, over the years, God knows I've, I've read enough 
you know, thousands of case studies and, and we do an award series um, based on case studies. And one of them came from Turkey for Finnish, a dishwashing, um, a dishwasher detergent. Right. And it, in addition to making your dishes sparkly, a, a, a product attribute, it also used less water. And Turkey is a country that um, is going That's through a series right. of, of droughts. And so they did extraordinary things, extraordinary things. I won't go into it now, but but that was really taking um, the uh, what you say um, to the next level. But they also did it through the lens of, dare I say, purpose. Um, perhaps another overused buzzword, but um, I'm I'm curious as to how you relate seeing the how and looking larger to today's concerns with um, purpose and and delivering for all sharehold uh, sh shareholders and stakeholders and so on and so forth. Yeah, purpose has been growing in importance as product differentiation has shrunk down and. Um, and it had been harder to obtain competitive advantage by having a better mousetrap. Uh, you know, and like anything else, it's great theory, but it's really hard to do. Because uh, one, you have to have a purpose that you can deliver on in more than an ad. Uh, two, you have to um, connect that purpose to the product at some point. And many brands are doing it. So the execution is hard. I mean, Dove has, has had one for, yes. for many years about real beauty, and they've done a very good job of that issue. But then how do they continuously connect that to say that I believe in their cause, but when I'm at the shelf, am I going to go for the Olay or the Dove? You know, yeah, it, it's hard to do. Most marketers do a pretty good job of getting it in their advertising to get people to, you know, pay attention. But a less solid job of connecting the sky to the ground. <laughs> yeah, that's a great purpose, but, and I applaud you. And some people vote with their, you know, with their uh, with their shopping, uh, it's more more prevalent. But ultimately, um, purpose is is here to stay. But the the gap between people doing purpose right and purpose as a borrowed interest thing to try to and the the ability of consumers who are especially younger consumers who are really keen on authenticity. And you know, if you say you're going to be for blank, uh, you better do it in more than an ad. So going back to the the you know the the dishwasher, this cascades doing the same thing in the U.S. now, where they're doing some education advertising saying that you know even if you have a third of a full dishwasher, it's better to run the dishwasher than to run those you know eight items in your sink uh, under running water. But you know, and that's a good first step. <laughs> but they're going to have to if they want to own that idea about water conservation, they're going to have to have more actions than just a product sell associated with it and it's hard to do no i i think action is is the the key you know that yeah. that that always is it, it is the key um let let me ask you two things um because i i have a feeling that we could probably talk for hours um <laughs> much to your listeners uh, <laughs> uh -huh. right well let me um um what would you advise a new cmo today um, I would remind them that, unfortunately, statistics say that they're not going to be there in five years. <laughs> so, you know, you know, being around, you know, they don't have a long shelf life. Um, they will look at a portfolio of, you know, they could do 10 things, 20 things need doing. Everyone will have different ideas because the challenge of marketing is that everyone knows marketing, you know, <laughs> and everyone is an expert marketer. Um, but ultimately, the most important thing for me, the advice I often give is focus on two things, three things max, uh, that you think you can execute brilliantly, uh, and execute it because you have the skill set, or execute it because a company has the DNA to be able to do it, or the appetite to do it, uh, and get two things done brilliantly, and resist the notion to fill up your agenda with five initiatives, four growth things, three sustainability things, because everyone will have an idea of what needs to be done. And if you say yes to everything, you will go back to um, Thomas Friedman's point. You'll be average at everything. 
And if you're average at everything, you will not have an impact. And forgetting influence and, you know, uh, you know word of mouth, um, you just can't be great at everything. So you're better off doing a few things really well and then moving on. And the way to do that is to get, you know, because everyone, everything looks great in PowerPoint. <laughs> so I'm a big advocator of stop thinking about it, stop analyzing it, go prototype it, try it out, have consumers touch it, have consumers use it. Um, and then if it works, good, go do it. Because most marketers don't remember how fast the world is moving. And most of them build something, get ready and launch it. By the time they launch it, it's been a year and a half since they spoke to consumers about the problem. The market has changed and they launch it and A, it's not perfect, doesn't nail it the first time. And well, and maybe their cheese has moved half the time. So they have to be able to see and see things faster. So the benefit of doing two or three things is you can possibly do them better and faster. And if you do better and faster, you have a better job of being around uh, two years from now versus you got 15 balls in the air. Each of them is half done. Some of them have crashed on takeoff. You know, because the only thing that makes people survive in companies is that they have a success and you have to build your own brand. And if you're just if you've just made everything a little better. No one gets credit for that. Now that that's that's very, very good advice. Very, very sage advice. Um, all right. Every author learns something when they write a book. Um, learn something unexpected or learn something about themselves. And I know this is, is not your first book, but this, this book did feel like a departure from some of your other ones and that it felt a little bit more personal to me. But can, do you want to end on sharing uh, if there's something that you discovered that you really hadn't expected? Uh, the, you know, to some extent, um, I looked back and said, you know, how did I get interested in marketing? Because no one grows up and says, you know, I want to do that, unless you, your parents are in the business, and my parents weren't in the business. Um, and I remember I had gone uh, overseas my junior year um, and had a great experience for a semester. And when I came back to the campus, I went to the Department of International Studies, and I said, great program. I really had phenomenal. I learned more. Yes, I went to classes, but I also... I took the train to cities and went to museums and breweries. And I said, well, you know, you must be sold out on the next couple. And they said, no, we, we have all these programs in Florence and, and we can't, we're struggling to get students to do it. I said, what do you mean you're struggling? So I did an elective and I took a, a marketing class in undergrad and I took that on. And I realized that when I spoke to lots of kids, why don't you go for a semester to Paris or London? You know, you had lots of facts. They gave you a hundred reasons why they couldn't go. I'm going to miss a football game. You know, there's a this party. And no matter how many things you told them factually about an experience you would get for the same tuition money studying in Florence or wherever it was, they didn't believe you. And I, I realized then I, I love conceptual problem solving where if you just tell people the facts, it's not enough. And I didn't realize how that influenced me later on. And I, this book reminded me that I still love problem solving more than marketing <laughs> and you know when marketing becomes about just doing the same thing over and over i'm not that interested but i'm most intrigued with marketers and companies that have a problem that you can't just punch everything into an excel spreadsheet and say we asked 42 consumers and 36 said yes make it blue you make it blue and you're a hero rarely does that happen and i'm still i love doing that whether i do it at NYU for startups, uh, or whether I do it for some of my clients today, but it's still, and you know, part of this book was to be less specific to um, brand strategy or brand technique, and more about great entrepreneurs who look at the market, they're problem solvers. They, they look at what it is and says, that's sort of strange. And it reminded me how much I like doing that more than just the practice of doing a brand strategy or doing an ad campaign or doing lots of things I've done over the years. 
I'm not sure that's a good answer, but that's sort of what I was. No, um, I, I think it, it's a, it's an absolutely honest answer. And and um, hey, it was either that or becoming, you know, a mystery novelist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Which probably would be more uh, more uh, liberating in many ways. No, but... I don't know. I don't know. But um, I, I think, though, that that you certainly achieved your task. And um, I'm I am just going to read now the full name of the book because I think that it 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 answers um, a, a, a lot of challenges out there. And it's seeing the how, transforming what people do, not buy to gain market advantage. And um, I, I think you absolutely deliver on that promise. And it has been a, a joy talking with you. And I, I hope we can talk again and you don't even have to write another book to be able to do that. <laughs> well, given how long the journey is, thank you for that relief. But I, I, it was great chatting with you, and uh, I look forward to talking soon. Me too. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Alan. Bye. The Internationalist focuses on the continual reinvention of marketing by highlighting inspirational marketers around the world and their ideas as they move the industry forward. Internationalist Marketing TV shares these perspectives through interviews and personal stories. Thanks so much for watching. If you find this kind of content helpful, please click like or subscribe. Again, thanks so much.